Welcome to the last part of the Eric Oakley miniseries. Today we're going to go over his forehand. Again, this is the third time you're hearing this. Make sure that you subscribe to his channel, Whale Pants. Make sure you check out Birdie Fuel, his flavor. Enjoy. So, forehand. Yeah, I, I don't know why I wasn't looking. Why I forgot that we were looking at this. Okay, here we go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love forehands. Uh, it's I it's one of my favorite things to teach and talk about because man, I I went from legitimately not having a forehand to mm -hmm. caddying for germ at USDGC. Well, I had a I had a forehand, but it was the overstable chopped over style forehand. And then I mm -hmm. caddied for germ USDGC when he was with Prodigy, so way back, way way back. And I was in the performance flight and he was in the, you know, the, oh, the, the better one. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, okay, I need to, I need to work on a forehand. So then I took my entire off season and worked on it. And it was amazing because I took under stable discs. I was using D line FDs and I said, I'm going to make this this fly. And you said this earlier about taking a disc in an mm -hmm. under stable disc and making it hyzer. That was my goal with the forehand. Was like I'm going to mm -hmm. throw this disc, and it's a D line FD that's beat to all all get out. But I'm going to make it hyzer. And if I do that, that's me controlling the disc completely. And mm -hmm. I worked with that. I worked with a, some other flippier discs like CD twos, um, you know, which is the the dynasty now. Um, is hence why we brought it back because it's so good. Uh, it allowed for my form to get really good because now i don't i have i have super hyzers all the way to slight force overs and, and big time force overs in a, in in a forehand so i have this huge mm -hmm. spectrum of of shot shapes i can now throw because i got comfortable and i understood how my body is supposed to move at all these different angles rather than having this flat or over the top only sidearm so mm -hmm. i i love talking about it i love sidearms i love teaching it yeah. to people i said hey like go and just go throw it with the flippiest disc you can if you can learn how to sidearm this disc you can sidearm anything and it i think that point stands true yeah it's a uh, at the amateur disc golf championships mm -hmm. i had um one of my players was on lead card she took second place in just a brutal fashion playoff Dang. Dang. For uh, the FPO. But yeah, Christine was commenting and she said, or she was commentating. And mm -hmm. she's like, man, I, these people have four. It's Emily threw a four and she's like, man, these people have four hands now. I, I didn't even start lear learning four hands until I was on the pro tour. And it wasn't mm -hmm. until I was a couple of years on the pro tour thinking, like, man, I need one of these. Yep. And I was just sitting there talking to the TV. I'm like, it's not. By mistake, like you're gonna have to have not just a serviceable forehand in a couple of years on tour, and you're leaving so much on table on the table if you don't have a forehand, let alone all the angles on the forehand. Totally, it's it's just an incredible addition to anyone's game to just it's, start messing with it. And I always start mm -hmm. with the understable slot. Yep. Like take something, take a, a flippy fairway driver like your D line FDs. <laughs> And get those things to just fly relatively straight um, and just hit them easy and just learn learn that shot. And Mikey will tell you that his uh, his game, how many strokes? Five strokes better on average. He averages wow. five strokes better with because he knows like what he's doing with his forehand now. It's wild. Yeah, because well, you're not you're not having to force shots at that point. You right. you having a uh, a well div like a diverse game if if, if mm -hmm. you have uh, and and skill set uh, it, it there's two things two factors that come into play is that one you have the tool for any situation you're in but then mm -hmm. it only adds one extra layer which is sh uh, shot selection being mm -hmm. something that you have to get good at. And dis shot and dis selection, which is something that happens on the pro tour that I think is most players' mistakes are disc 
and shot selection mistakes. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's rarely a really bad form mistake. It's that they should right. have thrown a different disc on a, on slightly more hyzer, but they you know stepped up to a shot and had an idea in their mind. They just made the, that mistake. Is so I completely mm-hmm. agree with you know why having a forehand helps and why having a diverse forehand and why having a diverse backhand and overhands rollers whatever we can go into all of them but yeah that's yeah. a huge part of the game yep super important for yeah i could go into example after example but we'll <laughs> yeah, go we'll go into the forehand here podcast time uh, <laughs> yeah podcast. i know we we just uh we'll, we'll just like chop up all the extra pieces here and it's just gonna I, all about it it's more content podcast, for you yeah. guys it's more hype for <laughs> you guys are helping me you know to grow a little bit it's a it's a win on all parts and i'm ready to share it around and it's it's we're winning here so it's good yeah well they're gonna love this i guarantee it ipad okay i changed to the ipad view so, again, the visible portions I really love. So this is got everything that I've been harping on <laughs> recently about this. And you do it so early. You do one of the big pieces so early, which is the offhand coming mm-hmm. across here, across and bent with this arm mm-hmm. to get the shoulders turned away from the target. A lot of people have the offhand like too forward or just down or somewhere weird. But uh you've got Balance. you've got all the pieces here. So we've got the I got the snot bubble in my nose again. <laughs> it like it like blocks each navel nasal passage perfectly to where I can't talk without being Vanessa Hudgens. <laughs> So, okay, here we go. Oh, it's man. gone now again. Here we go. So the off arm across, that's piece one. The bend in the waist so that your elbow can path through the, like, what Eagle said at one point is, like, the waist here mm-hmm. is the power pocket for the for the forehand. It's like mm-hmm. this is where we have to create the space here for the forehand to pass through. Oh, yeah. Um, and then your elbow, your right elbow is on this side of your body on your take back. It's not back behind your body in yeah. reference to your line. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, this foot is off so that your hips are off this way. All right, a lot of people try to... Let me clear this. A lot of people try to put this foot forward like this, and now their hips are open up forward, and so they can't use them. Yeah, because they're already be fired, to. basically, or they never loaded. Which, people always think that this is what Ryan Sheldon is talking about, is this step. But it's not. Anyways, it's just <laughs> like... He, they think we're saying two different things, but we're talking about two two different parts of the throw. Yeah. Anyways, so this like this is what I call the prep step here. So again, arm across, space... Oh, let me just do this. I just use a squilly. So, arm across, that's point one. Space here, point two. The elbow on this side of the body, like we showed, not back behind you. The foot pointing off so that the hips and the shoulders are pointed this way. And then the wrist has some bend to it, which I'll put a tiny five there. Yeah. So... This has all the components of a good preparation step for me. Let's go. That's a win. Yep. And then here, as you stride, you're coming in. The heel first um, happens with most people. It's just like your weight's in a good spot here. And then what we want to see is now this off this offhand, I just thought about we're wearing swanky disc golf stuff. And he had this clip where he's like clearing the curtain, clearing the curtain. And he like still throws crappy forehands. <laughs> he's like, Josh from Throw said, clear the curtain. So like clear the curtain with this offhand. And uh, you're doing that. That starts rotating the shoulders forward. And then what we want to see here is that this right hip moves forward and this left hip kind of moves back. So you end up rotating the hips in place here. 
Here's the right hip moving forward and the left hip moving back. Yeah, maybe the stride is like, hmm. Yeah, I've seen both. I think it's being accomplished well enough. It's not like your hips are trapped. Yeah, I think the one part that I've noticed with some forehands is that I snap and then I come through and I end up parallel, where there are some times where I've seen like Sexton come all the way through and almost step off the pad with his right foot. So his right foot comes all the way around and ends up basically in front of his left foot because he's allowed for his body to continue all the way through. Um, and I'm not sure what has caused me to kind of like hit and come and just stop there, but it seems it, it I'm confident and I get plenty of distance, but at the same time, uh, there are some forehands that I've thrown where I've gone for a little extra where I felt my body just naturally stepping through and I get a lot more going. So I think that mm -hmm. that could be just a, a better hip rotation and hip uh, push through that my body can't stop parallel. It has to keep going for it to, to not hurt itself or something. So Right. I think the length of this step makes it harder for this hip to really swing around because sure. it's trying to kind of keep your weight back with how forward this foot is. Mm -hmm. So probably don't need that large of a stride and yeah. it'll probably help your hip come forward a little bit more. And also it, this is what Ryan Sheldon's talking about here is that the hip is out in front of this elbow. Mm -hmm. I hate when the line does that. Oh. <laughs> this hips out in front of this elbow here. And so the yep. hips leading the way of the throw, and then you can get open here. Like mm -hmm. this is a lot of separation between yeah. your between your uh, hip and your elbow here. By the time you go to hit, yeah. So that this position will naturally put some wear. Have you ever seen this position? Have you looked at that like that? Uh, <laughs> did you know I mean, your body did am that? I broken? I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it done in like slow mo's, so it's I've seen it a little bit. But God, it's yeah, wild. It's always <laughs> crazy to watch it. Yeah, yeah. But I think it would be easier on your arm. Hello. Okay, I'm back. This is where I. I'm like, let me stand up. Um, I think it'd be easier on the arm if sure. uh, if the stride was a little shorter, so that your hip. So that right hip could come through a little bit more, mm -hmm. and then the elbow wouldn't have to fire so far past the hip. It could be, yeah, just to to kind of shift the shift the weight transfer and just a little bit, just to be uh, just slightly more balanced. And then we're talking. I know you're not talking like, oh, the front foot needs to be like a full foot. It's like we're talking very small yeah. amount to stay balanced here, right? Right. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how far that is, but it's uh, yeah, probably a bit shorter. So the, the other part that I really focus on, especially with, um, is this, it's like a, the snap out of like, I yes. really, it's the wrist motion, which I, is like, mm -hmm. you can see in that it's just, it's like, you can see that while my arm is back and my elbows looks like it's breaking, it's, there's a lot of wrist load and that is i think helps yes. so much with the the release and timing it's yeah it's most of it yeah it's it's the vast majority of the forehand happens there mm -hmm. <laughs> like that tiny little bit is is the wrist and just keeping that loose and able to snap through there and out so good and making sure that you don't like pull this line over here and try to snap yep. over this way. Also like the direction that you're snapping, like it came from here and it's over here. It's almost linear. Mm -hmm. So being able to snap in the right place is super important as well. I'm curious to see. <laughs> oh, this is the 200 foot. Let me go to the longer boy. Here we go.
Yeah, you see, he's got like a little his space, his hips a little tighter to where mm-hmm. his elbow finishes, so the elbow doesn't have to go like so far. Totally. Yep, and then he's able to stand up. I'm not so concerned about where the foot itself finishes. Like the fact that this is behind mm-hmm. his other foot is not an issue um, to me because it like it depends on so much on kind of how low you were and where you're throwing the shot. But and this is the big too, thing, right? Yeah, yeah. The type of I shot, I think, like Heiser releases, definitely. You don't need to come all the way through, but like maybe on a, a flat to maybe in slight forced over, you might right. want to because you're having to stand up and pull that pull that weight and your hip through the exactly. shot. Exactly. Yeah, if you threw like a a power Anheuser, I would expect your foot to finish more in front. And if you throw a hyzer, sure. I would expect your foot to be further back on the finish, just yeah, because of naturally like that. where the hip and the arm are going. On an anhyzer, you're kind of coming over the top with your swing path a little bit more, mm-hmm. so that right hip can, you know, ha- be free to move totally forward a little bit more. Versus if you're throwing a more severe hyzer, you're going to have to be more towards that back foot, more bent to the waist, and so you might not be able to get up. But 100%. this is the thing that I think is more important is that you can see where Andrew's right hip finished versus his left left hip. Like his mm-hmm. right hip is in front of his left hip. Yep. So let's see at what point he gets there. Let me clear that. Yeah, so we just want the hip to be able to move forward. Yeah. And if the if the stride is a little too long, no matter how good the footwork is, the the hip can't overcome the I mean you'd have to like really yeah, run into sure. it with some speed to overcome <laughs> like a really, really long last step. Totally. Totally. I think that's uh you know, the things that have helped guide my forehand has been that like not trying to overthrow discs. Hey, overthrow disc golf. Um, you know, it, don't overthrow this. Yeah, it's like I don't want to overthrow the disc. This. I I want to be smooth, and I'm I, I've talked about it as like I like to follow through forward first, which keeps me from ever rolling my wrists and doing all those things, and allows me to stay on my angle. Um, mm-hmm. And like uh, ever since uh, USDGC this year, I took I took a couple days off after MVP. I was like. I had I had a stretch of rounds where it was I think it was like seven rounds seven or eight rounds of worlds to the first uh, three rounds at Green Mountain where I felt like I was a genius and things were actually really working mm-hmm. it's the type of golf I wanted to play rainy round at GMC didn't play well my final round sucked but it happens that's how golf is and then I kind of like hit this like like plummet and I did not play well at at, at MVP and it was just in a weird spot so it took a few days. And then came back out like first time, first day at Winthrop was super windy, but I was throwing sidearms like a genius. And I felt like I was throwing things at 60%, but I was throwing like a 400 foot hyzer flip sidearm mm-hmm. with, with F like effortless. And it, I like the things that I was thinking about were be smooth, slow it down and snap your wrist, like really focus f- right. like that finish the forward, but snap your wrist and be clean. And I was throwing, you know, my caddy Kyle Deck works with another round, is one of the owners of another round. Um, mm-hmm. uh, he was like, yeah, you look like you're throwing an approach sidearm and ripping out a 350-foot controlled sidearm shot. Like that, mm-hmm. it's it's really fun to watch because you don't, it, you're not, it doesn't look like you're pressing the shot. Right. You're just letting it be natural and letting it fly smooth. And it's, and it's showing in your confidence. So it's like, okay, cool. And I've been really trying to, um, bring that into this whole off season of like, how do we keep this going? Because it feels really good and it feels really nice. And I've been feeling like it's, I've been a lot more snap in the wrist. And, um, yeah. Uh, another part of it is that I haven't felt much pain either, which is not something mm-hmm. I've never really, I've, I have felt pain in my forehand, but I think that was when I was trying to throw harder and farther. And then I, once I pulled off of that, my forehand is generally 
my arm will get sore, but it's not like, oh, I'm getting this debilitating elbow pain I need to wear KT tape and a wrist and an arm sleeve and all these other things. It's like, no, it's more mm-hmm. just, it's, um, it's, uh, just tired than anything mm-hmm. else. So that's just about being smart about your throw count and, you know, toning it back if you need to and taking a day off, especially when you get into your thirties, you have to think about that. I can't, I'm not a rubber band like Gannon Burr where I can go and mm-hmm. rip three rounds in a day and then play a four round tournament and keep playing every day after that. So, yeah. Kind yeah, throw counts is super important. I mm-hmm. every new student when they're learning forehand, if you're out here and you're getting excited about learning to throw forehand, my advice would be not to go out and throw a hundred forehands. No. Nope. Like just at the end of your backhand practice or whatever. Um just start sprinkling them in. Mm-hmm. And just on the course when you have a little two hundred foot shot. Throw throw whatever your first shot is, and then just do a couple up shots. Just same brain, dude. Them in, same brain. That's how. Yeah. We, that's the same things we talk about, Tina and I. It's like, yeah, give your just just do them, just do it. Like that's the way you're going to learn your forehand and is putting it in and throwing attainable distances. I think is the hardest right. part to like to teach is like in field work. It's 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 good because you can choose the distance yourself. But when you go to the course, you can walk up to a three hundred and 40 foot hole that is left to right moving. And then you're going to overthrow it for sure. You're right. absolutely going to overthrow it where mm-hmm. if you were to go 150 feet up the fairway and throw a 200 foot forehand, mm-hmm. like you could act, you could execute that and learn so much more than you can from chunking a right. chunking a, a disc, uh, trying to reach that shot. So I think that that's so important on those approaches like you talked about. Yeah. And it's especially easy to get trapped in forehands with pressing, like you're saying, it's, you think, okay, let me try a little, let me try to juice this one. And then you step a little too far because you're mm-hmm. trying to, so the extra effort turns into now you're stepping a foot further than you should be. So now that hip can't get involved in the shot and now it's all arm and you're not throwing how to, not learning how to throw a good forehand there. No, nope. You're just learning how to, you know, use your arm yeah. versus it- when you just step back and it's like, okay. What do I have right now? I I can press and throw a 250 foot forehand. Well, let me just try to ease up and throw a just as easy as possible 200 foot forehand. Sure. Can I just make an effortless 200 foot forehand first, mm-hmm. and just see how far can I just if I'm not trying? Because athletes, when athletes do it good, and for those of us who've gotten in the game not as children, yeah. um, not as Simon Lazat, yeah. which is most of us. The thing is, is a good athlete always makes it look easy. Mm-hmm. And so anytime you're there, and it's easy to forget, but it's like, how do they make it look easy? How did they get there? It wasn't by pressing to throw. You don't go, let me just press on the forehand, and mm-hmm. then one day it looks effortless. Like, oh, I'm pressing, sure. pressing, 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 pressing to get 400. Oh, now it's easy. No, it's like yeah. the way that you get effortless distance is you go for effortless distance. You practice effortless distance, and then the timing, and like you're saying, the when you're working just on the snap from your hand, just your wrist speed, it's like, then you learn, okay, f- far is fast. It's not hard. No, and exactly. So it's like, it's, I just need my wrist, I just need the disc moving fast. Yeah. And my body's moving hard. It's, I'm thing. not going to hit the line either, too. Right. More often than not. Yeah. So easy is the way is the way to get into it. I love it, man. That's I I hope people can just take this in like as a as a like legit like apply because I think there are a lot of players that I see and they're wild with their forehands but they can throw them forever, but I'm I just look at them and I'm like you have an expiration date. Yep. Like you absolutely do because you're not getting your whole body in the throw. You're, you're not, it is too much arm. And rather than like what you saw with Andy and, and my forehand is that you can see the lower body being engaged and activating mm-hmm. and transferring of, and the transfer of weight is all happening to help throw the sidearm. Mm-hmm. And that is, that I think is, is, 
sometimes is easy to overlook when you're playing rounds and you're throwing these forehands because yes, I can, I can chuck one as hard as I can all arm and get plenty of distance. And it's kind of pretty accurate with an overstable disc, but I am, mm-hmm. lit- I, again, I'm putting an expiration date on my, on my game and my forehand by doing that. So I think that's uh, hopefully something that uh, the fans will pick up on because it's, it, I, I, I'm hoping that more people play this game for the rest of their lives because that, mm-hmm. that means that means this sport survives and gets better like like we're supposed to. We're supposed to grow the sport. So that's what I'm hoping is the big takeaway is that people get that in their heads and stop hurting their bodies and take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yep. That's my that's my shtick. Mm-hmm. It's like let's have healthy let's have healthy form. And Maybe we get some distance along the way. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Love yep. It. Healthy, repeatable. And like I said, fast, not hard. Fast, not hard. Cool. Well, Thank- we'll wrap this bad boy out. Dude, what a video, huh? Yeah. What What a videos at this yeah. point. Uh, yeah. It's great. <laughs> what a video. <laughs> So, cool. Well, uh, your links are where? On your Instagram? For your yeah, sponsors and stuff like that? Uh, yeah. I mean, throw, like, just throw the Whale Sex website. It's a good place to support myself and Tina. Uh, mm-hmm. Whale Pants is our YouTube. The Eric Oakley on Instagram. You can throw on my Facebook. Doesn't matter. Like, those are all places that people can find me. I, I, I'm on Twitter, but I don't really, I don't post. I'm, yeah, I don't. I just don't care for it. Uh, not on TikTok. So yeah, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Whale Sacks. Go to infinitedisc.com. Go to Thoughtspace. Go to. Um, I don't think it's. I don't think it's going to be announced by then, but we can cut this out. But I will be signing with Clash. As I, obviously the collaboration with the Spice and everything was well, the way we're approaching this is like it's a collaboration. We're just doing this together. It's this like t- thing. And it's like, but then I really like the disc. So now I want to be on the team. So it's going to be my mm-hmm. third, third and final sponsor for like to round out the open bag thing. So it's going to be great. It's okay, be great. cool. By the way, um, I don't know who I would talk to about this, but, um, that student of mine that took second and then she took first at, um, USW DGC okay. on the, female am side she's she's looking for uh how how would i get her started on how did she submit to be like part of team infinite because that's where she really wants to be uh did she fill if she felt out the application that would be huge and just send me her name and i'll be like hey we should definitely keep an eye out for this because we do need to expand to the um the women's side and if she's an up-and-comer like why wouldn't we like it Mm -hmm. she's the type of person that we can support with like, you know, giving her opportunities that she can have infinite and other sponsors to get extra stuff to help get out on the road. But, um, you know, infinite would be like, Hey, we can get you some discs and take care of you a little bit, but nothing, mm-hmm. nothing big. But, um, uh, yeah, if she yeah, she's that a working girl, it'd be great. Yeah. She's a working girl. So she doesn't need too much. She's got like a doctorate and stuff. No, oh, she's big brain. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me know. Shoot, shoot me your name, and I would, I would definitely have them take a deeper look into it because coming from you know her results are speaking for themselves, which is probably good enough right. to get her on the team. But at the same time, a a shout out from somebody who's working with her and understands the work ethic. So because results only to paint so much of the picture. You could have just gotten mm-hmm. hot one weekend, and you're actually not that good of a disc golfer. Um, consistent of a disc golfer, you are a good disc golfer. But you know, but if you're talking about people are saying it's like, I understand the work that they're putting in and this, the plans that they have. Like once you understand that path, it's really easy to understand mm-hmm. how valuable a person can be for a team because too often right. people come to you and they're like, yeah, I want to be sponsored, but I work a nine to five and I don't really practice that much, but I really want to be sponsored. It's like, mm-hmm. sure, I get that. But like, how is that? Yeah. How do you, how do you help? a company how are you actually making a company better like you kind of aren't mm-hmm. like i know you you want it but i i yeah. genuinely think we will we are not far off 
from there being half as many sponsored players on half am side as many? half and i on the pro side i i genuinely think we it, it is is getting to the point where the companies aren't sure how to do it because you're in a place where you don't know how to value each and yeah. each and every individual like i bring a different value than a player that finishes consistently in the top 10 and that mm -hmm. and w which is better they're they're both are they both equal or they're just both so different and they have to be treated so differently and you mm -hmm. can't you can no longer treat sponsorships like this blanket yes this is what you get for being this this is what you get for doing this this mm -hmm. is what you get for doing that it's like no it's so indiv individualized that uh you have to kind of figure out the best ways to take care of, of players and for the company's sake i think that you're going to see a lot less sponsored players but i don't know i could be wrong yeah, no, I I would imagine because right now sponsorships there's a lot of like ambassador mm -hmm. sponsored players, which is not sponsored in my mind. Yeah. It's uh like discounts for plastic is it's like that's different than a sponsorship. Totally. Um or totally. it's a different it's a different level of sponsorship that mm -hmm. I personally don't think is the company's giving really too much there. It's like no, you just buy our plastic at a discount kind of rate. Well, that's, that's why it a, works because they don't have right. they, they can they they can have a bunch of ambassadors because it costs mm -hmm. them a couple hundred bucks per player. Gives them give them stuff. They're probably bu they're purchasing some of the team stuff, and yeah, they get fifty discs, which is yeah plenty. And then they're probably purchasing. 100 discs on top of that. So that's a, that's an easy win for them. Their 50 discs are easily covered and they sold 50 more discs. So, it's a win. Mm -mm. Um yeah, well, I'll I'll get her I'll get together with her and we'll put together a little value prop, make sure the applications in and I'll I'll drop sure, it in, but Please do. Um, Please do. I've got I mean, I've got lots of people that are like, "Oh, I want to be sponsored someday." And uh there's a reason I'm bringing up her name in conversation instead of everyone yeah, else's. Respect, because respect. I think it's, I think it's worth taking a look at. And yeah, yeah. I'll straight up tell someone. I'll, I'll straight, straight up tell a kid. <laughs> Robbie and I. Well, this one doesn't get put on the thing. But Robbie and I straight up put the smack down on some like sixteen-year-old kid who wanted to be sponsored, and mm -hmm. you know we apologized later. But it was like you have no value to yeah. a company. Yeah. So you can want like, it I'm, as bad as you want, but it doesn't matter if you if they can't immediately get the value. Like what? Mm -hmm. That doesn't do anything. Just because you yeah. play a lot doesn't mean you deserve to be sponsored. Doesn't mean even right. if you post a lot, it doesn't mean you deserve to be sponsored. You have to be making a difference in the sport and change and doing things mm -hmm. that that strive for that. Like, yeah, I when people ask me about that stuff, it's like you gotta do stuff that's different. You gotta be posting and legitimately trying to make disc golf a better place to stand mm -hmm. out these days. And it's not easy to do. Yeah. It was like, why didn't this company sponsor me? But they sponsored this 760 rated girl. It's like, well, she had six brand new ladies at the course the other day. And mm -hmm. so EV sevens gonna have a monopoly on every female player. Yep. Every female player's putter slot for in Atlanta. Yeah. Because she's literally bringing every female into the sport here. It's like her two other ladies. It's like, of course they would sponsor her yeah. over you. Like, makes what's another nine sense. eighty rated guy? Nothing. There's nothing. There's hundreds of of nine of the nine eighty guys out there. Yeah. And the kid was good. The kid yeah. was real good at disc golf. That's for darn sure. Mm hmm. But uh, you ain't yeah. doing Sierra in value add. She's a monster. Sierra's great, big fan. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah. Well, thanks. If there's anything I guess else we'll you need just from wait me, fifteen seconds, and then we can just round it out at an, at an even two hours of recording. Let's do it. So, <laughs> five, four, three, two, one. Um, again, thank you to Eric. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching, maybe you think, huh, this guy might know a little something that can help me be a little distance on my forehand. 
you can check out the link for our Patreon in the description below. And I look forward to working with you. Thanks, guys. You're the best. <laughs>